Chapter 11 The Mystery of Sex Transmutation The Tenth Step Toward Riches The meaning of the word transmute is, in simple language, the changing or transferring of one element or form of energy into another. The emotion of sex brings into being a state of mind. Because of ignorance on the subject, this state of mind is generally associated with the physical, and because of improper influences to which most people have been subjected in acquiring knowledge of sex, things essentially physical have highly biased the mind. The emotion of sex has back of it the possibility of three constructive potentialities. They are 1. The perpetuation of mankind. 2. The maintenance of health. As a therapeutic agency, it has no equal. 3. The transformation of mediocrity into genius through transmutation. Sex transmutation is simple and easily explained. It means the switching of the mind from thoughts of physical expression to thoughts of some other nature. Sex desire is the most powerful of human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge it. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness of imagination, courage, etc., which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. The transmutation of sexual energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind, and spirit of man. If not given this form of outlet, through transmutation, it will seek outlets through purely physical channels. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotion of sex. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever-seeking means of expression. If it is not transmuted into some creative effort, it will find a less worthy outlet. Fortunate indeed is the person who has discovered how to give sex emotion an outlet through some form of creative effort, for he has, by that discovery, lifted himself to the status of a genius. Scientific research has disclosed these significant facts. 1. The men of greatest achievement are men with highly developed sex natures, men who have learned the art of sex transmutation. 2. The men who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture, and the professions were motivated by the influence of a woman. The research from which these astounding discoveries were made went back through the pages of biography and history for more than 2,000 years. Wherever there was evidence available in connection with the lives of men and of great achievement, it indicated most convincingly that they possessed highly developed sex natures. The emotion of sex is an irresistible force against which there can be no such opposition as an immovable body. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth and you will catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation will lift one to the status of a genius. The emotion of sex contains the secret of creative ability. Destroy the sex glands, whether in man or beast, and you have removed the major source of action. For proof of this, observe what happens to any animal after it has been castrated. A bull becomes as docile as a cow after it has been altered sexually. Sex alteration takes out of the male, whether man or beast, all the fight that was in him. Sex alteration of the female has the same effect. The Ten Mind Stimuli The human mind responds to stimuli through which it may be keyed up to high rates of vibration known as enthusiasm, creative imagination, intense desire, etc. The stimuli to which the mind responds most freely are 1. The desire for sex expression 2. Love 3. A burning desire for fame, power, or financial gain, money. 4. Music. 
5. Friendship between either of those of the same sex or those of the opposite sex. 6. A mastermind alliance based upon the harmony of two or more people who ally themselves for spiritual or temporal advancement. 7. Mutual suffering, such as that experienced by people who are persecuted. 8. Auto-suggestion. 9. Fear. 10. Narcotics and alcohol. The desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli which most effectively step up the vibrations of the mind and start the wheels of physical action. Eight of these stimuli are natural and constructive. Two are destructive. The list is here presented for the purpose of enabling you to make a comparative study of the major sources of mind stimulation. From this study, it will be readily seen that the emotion of sex is by great odds the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. This comparison is necessary as a foundation for proof of the statement that transmutation of sex energy may lift one to the status of a genius. Let us find out what constitutes a genius. Some wiseacre has said that a genius is a man who wears long hair, eats queer food, lives alone, and serves as a target for the joke makers. A better definition of a genius is a man who has discovered how to increase the vibrations of thought to the point where he can freely communicate with sources of knowledge not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought. The person who thinks will want to ask some questions concerning this definition of genius. The first question will be, how may one communicate with sources of knowledge which are not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought? The next question will be, are there known sources of knowledge which are available only to genii? And if so, what are these sources, and exactly how may they be reached? We shall offer proof of the soundness of some of the more important statements made in this book, or at least we shall offer evidence through which you may secure your own proof through experimentation, and in doing so we shall answer both of these questions. Genius is developed through the sixth sense. The reality of the sixth sense has been fairly well established. This sixth sense is creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is one which the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime, and if used at all, it usually happens by mere accident. A relatively small number of people use, with deliberation and purpose of forethought, the faculty of creative imagination. Those who use this faculty voluntarily and with understanding of its function are genii. The faculty of creative imagination is the direct link between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence. All so-called revelations referred to in the realm of religion and all discoveries of basic or new principles in the field of invention take place through the faculty of creative imagination. When ideas or concepts flash into one's mind through what is popularly called a hunch, they come from one or more of the following sources. 1. Infinite Intelligence 2. One subconscious mind, wherein is stored every sense impression and thought impulse which ever reached the brain through any of the five senses. 3. From the mind of some other person who has just released the thought or picture of the idea or concept through conscious thought or 4. From the other person's subconscious storehouse. There are no other known sources from which inspired ideas or hunches may be received. The creative imagination functions best when the mind is vibrating due to some form of mind stimulation at an exceedingly high rate, that is, when the mind is functioning at a rate of vibration higher than that of ordinary normal thought. When brain action has been stimulated through one or more of the ten mind stimulants, it has the effect of lifting the individual far above the horizon of ordinary thought and permits him to envision distant scope and quality of thoughts not available on the lower plane, such as that occupied while one is engaged in the solution of the problems of business and professional routine. When lifted to this higher level of thought, through any form of mind stimulation, an individual occupies, relatively, the same position as one who has ascended in an airplane to a height from which he may see over and beyond the horizon line, which limits his vision while on the ground. Moreover, while on this higher level of thought, the individual is not hampered or bound by any of the stimuli which circumscribe and limit his vision while wrestling with the problems of gaining the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. 
He is in a world of thought in which the ordinary workaday thoughts have been as effectively removed as are the hills and valleys and other limitations of physical vision when he rises in an airplane. While on this exalted plane of thought, the creative faculty of the mind is given freedom for action. The way has been cleared for the sixth sense to function. It becomes receptive to ideas which could not reach the individual under any other circumstances. The sixth sense is the faculty which marks the difference between a genius and an ordinary individual. The creative faculty becomes more alert and receptive to vibrations originating outside the individual's subconscious mind. The more this faculty is used and the more the individual relies upon it and makes demands upon it for thought impulses. This faculty can be cultivated and developed only through use. That which is known as one's conscious operates entirely through the faculty of the sixth sense. The great artists, writers, musicians, and poets become great because they acquire the habit of relying upon the still small voice which speaks from within through the faculty of creative imagination. It is a fact well known to people who have keen imaginations that their best ideas come through so-called hunches. There is a great orator who does not attain to greatness until he closes his eyes and begins to rely entirely upon the faculty of creative imagination. When asked why he closed his eyes just before the climaxes of his oratory, he replied, I do it because then I speak through ideas which come to me from within. One of America's most successful and best-known financiers followed the habit of closing his eyes for two or three minutes before making a decision. When asked why he did this, he replied, With my eyes closed, I am able to draw upon a source of superior intelligence. The late Dr. Elmer R. Gates of Chevy Chase, Maryland, created more than 200 useful patents, many of them basic, through the process of cultivating and using the creative faculty. His method is both significant and interesting to one interested in attaining to the status of genius, in which category Dr. Gates unquestionably belonged. Dr. Gates was one of the really great, though less publicized, scientists of the world. In his laboratory, he had what he called his personal communication room. It was practically soundproof and so arranged that all light could be shut out. It was equipped with a small table on which he kept a pad of writing paper. In front of the table on the wall was an electric push button which controlled the lights. When Dr. Gates desired to drop on the forces available to him through his creative imagination, he would go into this room, seat himself at the table, shut off the lights, and concentrate upon the known factors of the invention on which he was working, remaining in that position until ideas began to flash into his mind in connection with the unknown factors of the invention. On one occasion, ideas came through so fast that he was forced to write for almost three hours. When the thoughts stopped flowing and he examined his notes, he found that they contained a minute description of principles which had not a parallel among the known data of the scientific world. Moreover, the answer to his problem was intelligently presented in those notes. In this manner, Dr. Gates completed over 200 patents, which had been begun, but not completed, by half-baked brains. Evidence of the truth of this statement is in the United States Patent Office. Dr. Gates earned his living by sitting for ideas for individuals and corporations. Some of the largest corporations in America paid him substantial fees by the hour for sitting for ideas. The reasoning faculty is often faulty because it is largely guided by one's accumulated experience. Not all knowledge which one accumulates through experience is accurate. Ideas received through the creative faculty are much more reliable for the reason that they come from sources more reliable than any which are available to the reasoning faculty of the mind. The major difference between the genius and the ordinary crank inventor may be found in the fact that the genius works through his faculty of creative imagination, while the crank knows nothing of this faculty. The scientific inventor, such as Mr. Edison and Dr. Gates, makes use of both the synthetic and the creative faculties of imagination. For example, the scientific inventor or genius begins an invention by organizing and combining the known ideas or principles accumulated through experience, through the synthetic faculty, the reasoning faculty. 
If he finds this accumulated knowledge to be insufficient for the completion of his invention, he then draws upon the sources of knowledge available to him through his creative faculty. The method by which he does this varies with the individual, but this is the sum and substance of his procedure. 1. He stimulates his mind so that it vibrates on a higher than average plane, using one or more of the ten mind stimulants or some other stimulant of his choice. 2. He concentrates upon the known factors, the finished part, of his invention and creates in his mind a perfect picture of unknown factors, the unfinished part of his invention. He holds this picture in his mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious mind, then relaxes by clearing his mind of all thought and waits for his answers to flash into his mind. Sometimes the results are both definite and immediate. At other times the results are negative depending upon the state of development of the sixth sense or creative faculty. Mr. Edison tried out more than 10,000 different combinations of ideas through the synthetic faculty of his imagination before he tuned in through the creative faculty and got the answer which perfected the incandescent light. His experience was similar when he produced the talking machine. There is plenty of reliable evidence that the faculty of creative imagination exists. This evidence is available through accurate analysis of men who have become leaders in their respective callings without having had extensive educations. Lincoln was a notable example of a great leader who achieved greatness through the discovery and use of his faculty of creative imagination. He discovered and began to use this faculty as the result of the stimulation of love which he experienced after he met Anne Rutledge, a statement of the highest significance in connection with the study of the source of genius. The pages of history are filled with the records of great leaders whose achievements may be traced directly to the influence of women who aroused the creative faculties of their minds through the stimulation of sex desire. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of these. When inspired by his first wife, Josephine, he was irresistible and invincible. When his better judgment or reasoning faculty prompted him to put Josephine aside, he began to decline his defeat and St. Helena were not far distant. If good taste would permit, we might easily mention scores of men, well known to the American people, who climbed to great heights of achievement under the stimulating influence of their wives, only to drop back to destruction after money and power went to their heads and they put aside the old wife for a new one. Napoleon was not the only man to discover that sex influence from the right source is more powerful than any substitute of expediency which may be created by mere reason. The human mind responds to stimulation. Among the greatest and most powerful of these stimuli is the urge of sex. When harnessed and transmuted this driving force is capable of lifting men into that higher sphere of thought which enables them to master the sources of worry and petty annoyance which beset their pathway on the lower plane. Unfortunately, only the genii have made the discovery. Others have accepted the experience of sex urge without discovering one of its major potentialities, a fact which accounts for the great number of others as compared to the limited number of genii. For the purpose of refreshing the memory in connection with the facts available from the biographies of certain men, we here present the names of a few men of outstanding achievement each of whom was known to have been of a highly sexed nature. The genius which was theirs undoubtedly found its source of power in transmuted sex energy. George Washington, Napoleon Bonaparte, William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Robert Burns, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Hubbard, Albert H. Gary, Oscar Wilde, Woodrow Wilson, John H. Patterson, Andrew Jackson, Enrico Caruso, your own knowledge of biography will enable you to add to this list. Find, if you can, a single man in all history of civilization who achieved outstanding success in any calling who was not driven by a well-developed sex nature. If you do not wish to rely upon biographies of men not now living, take inventory of those whom you know to be men of great achievement and see if you can find one among them who is not highly sexed. Sex energy is the creative energy of all genii. There never has been and never will be a great leader, builder, or artist lacking in this driving force of sex. 
Surely, no one will misunderstand these statements to mean that all who are highly sexed are genii. Man attains to the status of genius only when and if he stimulates his mind so that it draws upon the forces available through the creative faculty of the imagination. Chief among the stimuli with which this stepping up of the vibrations may be produced is sex energy. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Far from becoming genii, because of great sex desires, the majority of men lower themselves through misunderstanding and misuse of this great force to the status of the lower animals. Why men seldom succeed before 40. I discovered from the analysis of over 25,000 people that men who succeed in an outstanding way seldom do so before the age of 40 and more often they do not strike their real pace until they are well beyond the age of 50. This fact was so astounding that it prompted me to go into the study of its cause most carefully, carrying the investigation over a period of more than 12 years. This study disclosed the fact that the major reason why the majority of men who succeeded do not begin to do so before the age of 40 to 50 is their tendency to dissipate their energies through overindulgence in physical expression of the emotion of sex. The majority of men never learn that the urge of sex has other possibilities, which far transcend in importance that of mere physical expression. The majority of those who make this discovery do so after having wasted many years at a period when the sex energy is at its height, prior to the age of 45 to 50. This usually is followed by noteworthy achievement. The lives of many men up to and sometimes well past the age of 40 reflect a continued dissipation of energies which could have been more profitably turned into better channels. Their finer and more powerful emotions are sown wildly in the four winds. Out of this habit of the male grew the term sowing his wild oats. The desire for sexual expression is by far the strongest and most impelling of all human emotions and for this very reason this desire when harnessed and transmuted into action other than that of physical expression may raise one to the status of a genius. One of America's most able businessmen frankly admitted that his attractive secretary was responsible for most of the plans he created. He admitted that her presence lifted him to heights of creative imagination such as he could experience under no other stimulus. One of the most successful men in America owes most of his success to the influence of a very charming young woman who has served as his source of inspiration for more than 12 years. Everyone knows the man to whom this reference is made, but not everyone knows the real source of his achievements. History is not lacking in examples of men who attained to the status of genii as the result of the use of artificial mind stimulants in the form of alcohol and narcotics. Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven while under the influence of liquor, dreaming dreams that mortal never dared to dream before. James Whitcomb Riley did his best writing while under the influence of alcohol. Perhaps it was thus he saw the ordered intermingling of the real and the dream, the mill above the river and the mist above the stream. Robert Burns wrote best when intoxicated, For Auld Lang Syne, my dear, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for Auld Lang Syne. But let it be remembered that many such men have destroyed themselves in the end. Nature has prepared her own potions with which men may safely stimulate their minds so they vibrate on a plane that enables them to tune in to fine and rare thoughts which come from no man knows where. No satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found. It is a fact well known to psychologists that there is a very close relationship between sex desires and spiritual urges, a fact which accounts for the peculiar behavior of people who participate in the orgies known as religious revivals, common among the primitive types. The world is ruled and the destiny of civilization is established by the human emotions. People are influenced in their actions not by reason so much as by feelings. The creative faculty of the mind is set into action entirely by emotions and not by cold reason. The most powerful of all human emotions is that of sex. 
There are other mind stimulants, some of which have been listed, but no one of them, nor all of them combined, can equal the driving power of sex. A mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the vibrations of thought. The ten major stimulants described are those most commonly resorted to. Through these sources one may commune with an infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind, either one's own or that of another person, a procedure which is all there is of genius. A teacher, who has trained and directed the efforts of more than 30,000 salespeople, made the astounding discovery that highly sexed men are the most efficient salesmen. The explanation is that the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is nothing more or less than sex energy. Highly sexed people always have a plentiful supply of magnetism. Through cultivation and understanding, this vital force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in the relationships between people. This energy may be communicated to others through the following media. 1. The handshake. The touch of the hand indicates instantly the presence of magnetism or the lack of it. 2. The tone of voice. Magnetism or sex energy is the factor with which the voice may be colored or made musical and charming. 3. Posture and carriage of the body. Highly sexed people move briskly and with grace and ease. 4. The vibrations of thought. Highly sexed people mix the emotion of sex with their thoughts or may do so at will and in that way may influence those around them. 5. Body adornment. People who are highly sexed are usually very careful about their personal appearance. They usually select clothing of a style becoming to their personality, physique, complexion, etc. When employing salesmen, the more capable sales manager looks for the quality of personal magnetism as the first requirement of a salesman. People who lack sex energy will never become enthusiastic nor inspire others with enthusiasm, and enthusiasm is one of the most important requisites in salesmanship, no matter what one is selling. The public speaker, orator, preacher, lawyer, or salesman who is lacking in sex energy is a flop as far as being able to influence others is concerned. Couple with this the fact that most people can be influenced only through an appeal to their emotions and you will understand the importance of sex energy as a part of the salesman's native ability. Master salesmen attain the status of mastery in selling because they, either consciously or unconsciously, transmute the energy of sex into sales enthusiasm. In this statement may be found a very practical suggestion as to the actual meaning of sex transmutation. The salesman who knows how to take his mind off the subject of sex and direct it in sales effort with as much enthusiasm and determination as he would apply to its original purpose has acquired the art of sex transmutation, whether he knows it or not. The majority of salesmen who transmute their sex energy do so without being in the least aware of what they are doing or how they are doing it. Transmutation of sex energy calls for more willpower than the average person cares to use for this purpose. Those who find it difficult to summon willpower sufficient for transmutation may gradually acquire this ability. Though this requires willpower, the reward for the practice is more than worth the effort. The entire subject of sex is one with which the majority of people appear to be unpardonably ignorant. The urge of sex has been grossly misunderstood, slandered, and burlesqued by the ignorant and the evil-minded for so long that the very word sex is seldom used in polite society. Men and women who are known to be blessed, yes, blessed, with highly sexed natures are usually looked upon as being people who will bear watching. Instead of being called blessed, they are usually called cursed. Millions of people, even in this age of enlightenment, have inferiority complexes which they developed because of this false belief that a highly sexed nature is a curse. These statements of the virtue of sex energy should not be construed as justification for the libertine. The emotion of sex is a virtue only when used intelligently and with discrimination. It may be misused, and often is, to such an extent that it debases instead of enriches both body and mind. The better use of this power is the burden of this chapter. 
It seemed quite significant to the author when he made the discovery that practically every great leader whom he had the privilege of analyzing was a man whose achievements were largely inspired by a woman. In many instances, the woman in the case was a modest, self-denying wife of whom the public had heard but little or nothing. In a few instances, the source of inspiration has been traced to the other woman. Perhaps such cases may not be entirely unknown to you. Intemperance in sex habits is just as detrimental as intemperance in habits of drinking and eating. In this age in which we live, an age which began with the World War, intemperance in habits of sex is common. This orgy of indulgence may account for the shortage of great leaders. No man can avail himself of the forces of his creative imagination while dissipating them. Man is the only creature on earth which violates nature's purpose in this connection. Every other animal indulges its sex nature in moderation and with purpose which harmonizes with the laws of nature. Every other animal responds to the call of sex only in season. Man's inclination is to declare open season. Every intelligent person knows that stimulation in excess through alcoholic drink and narcotics is a form of intemperance which destroys the vital organs of the body, including the brain. Not every person knows, however, that overindulgence in sex expression may become a habit as destructive and as detrimental to creative effort as narcotics or liquor. A sex-mad man is not essentially different than a dope-mad man. Both have lost control over their faculties of reason and willpower. Sexual overindulgence may not only destroy reason and willpower, but it may also lead to either temporary or permanent insanity. Many cases of hypochondria, imaginary illness, grow out of habits developed in ignorance of the true function of sex. From these brief references to the subject, it may be readily seen that ignorance on the subject of sex transmutation forces stupendous penalties upon the ignorant on the one hand and withholds from them equally stupendous benefits on the other. Widespread ignorance on the subject of sex is due to the fact that the subject has been surrounded with mystery and beclouded by dark silence. The conspiracy of mystery and silence has had the same effect upon the minds of young people that the psychology of prohibition had. The result has been increased curiosity and desire to acquire more knowledge on this verboten subject. And, to the shame of all lawmakers and most physicians, by training best qualified to educate youth on that subject, information has not been easily available. Seldom does an individual enter upon highly creative effort in any field of endeavor before the age of 40. The average man reaches the period of his greatest capacity to create between 40 and 60. These statements are based upon analysis of thousands of men and women who have been carefully observed. They should be encouraging to those who fail to arrive before the age of 40 and to those who become frightened at the approach of old age around the 40-year mark. The years between 40 and 50 are, as a rule, the most fruitful. Man should approach this age not with fear and trembling, but with hope and eager anticipation. If you want evidence that most men do not begin to do their best work before the age of 40, study the records of the most successful men known to the American people, and you will find it. Henry Ford had not hit his pace of achievement until he had passed the age of 40. Andrew Carnegie was well past 40 before he began to reap the reward of his efforts. James J. Hill was still running a telegraph key at the age of 40. His stupendous achievements took place after that age. Biographies of American industrialists and financiers are filled with evidence that the period from 40 to 60 is the most productive age of man. Between the ages of 30 and 40, man begins to learn, if he ever learns, the art of sex transmutation. This discovery is generally accidental, and more often than otherwise, the man who makes it is totally unconscious of his discovery. He may observe that his powers of achievement have increased around the age of 35 to 40, but in most cases he is not familiar with the cause of this change, that nature begins to harmonize the emotions of love and sex in the individual between the ages of 30 and 40, so that he may draw upon these great forces and apply them jointly as stimuli to action. 
Sex alone is a mighty urge to action, but its forces are like a cyclone. They are often uncontrollable. When the emotion of love begins to mix itself with the emotion of sex, the result is calmness of purpose, poise, accuracy of judgment, and balance. What person who has attained to the age of 40 is so unfortunate as to be unable to analyze these statements and to corroborate them by his own experience? When driven by his desire to please a woman based solely upon the emotion of sex, a man may be, and usually is, capable of great achievement, but his actions may be disorganized, distorted, and totally destructive. When driven by his desire to please a woman based upon the motive of sex alone, a man may steal, cheat, and even commit murder. But when the emotion of love is mixed with the emotion of sex, that same man will guide his actions with more sanity, balance, and reason. Criminologists have discovered that the most hardened criminals can be reformed through the influence of a woman's love. There is no record of a criminal having been reformed solely through the sex influence. These facts are well known, but their cause is not. Reformation comes, if at all, through the heart or emotional side of man, not through his head or reasoning side. Reformation means a change of heart. It does not mean a change of head. A man may, because of reason, make certain changes in his personal conduct to avoid the consequences of undesirable effects, but genuine reformation comes only through a change of heart, through a desire to change. Love, romance, and sex are all emotions capable of driving men to heights of super-achievement. Love is the emotion which serves as a safety valve and ensures balance, poise, and constructive effort. When combined, these three emotions may lift one to an altitude of a genius. There are genii, however, who know but little of the emotion of love. Most of them may be found engaged in some form of action which is destructive, or at least not based upon justice and fairness toward others. If good taste would permit, a dozen genii could be named in the field of industry and finance who ride ruthlessly over the rights of their fellow men. They seem totally lacking in conscience. The reader can easily supply his own list of such men. The emotions are states of mind. Nature has provided man with a chemistry of the mind which operates in a manner similar to the principles of chemistry of matter. It is a well-known fact that through the aid of chemistry of matter, a chemist may create a deadly poison by mixing certain elements, none of which are in themselves harmful in the right proportions. The emotions may likewise be combined so as to create a deadly poison. The emotions of sex and jealousy, when mixed, may turn a person into an insane beast. The presence of any one or more of the destructive emotions in the human mind, through the chemistry of the mind, sets up a poison which may destroy one's sense of justice and fairness. In extreme cases, the presence of any combination of these emotions in the mind may destroy one's reason. The road to genius consists of the development, control, and use of sex, love, and romance. Briefly, the process may be stated as follows. Encourage the presence of these emotions as the dominating thoughts in one's mind and discourage the presence of all the destructive emotions. The mind is a creature of habit. It thrives upon the dominating thoughts fed it. Through the faculty of willpower, one may discourage the presence of any emotion and encourage the presence of any other. Control of the mind through the power of will is not difficult. Control comes from persistence and habit. The secret of control lies in understanding the process of transmutation. When any negative emotion presents itself in one's mind, it can be transmuted into a positive or constructive emotion by the simple procedure of changing one's thoughts. There is no other road to genius than through voluntary self-effort. A man may attain to great heights of financial or business achievement solely by the driving force of sex energy but history is filled with evidence that he may, and usually does, carry with him certain traits of character which rob him of the ability to either hold or enjoy his fortune. This is worthy of analysis, thought, and meditation, for it states a truth the knowledge of which may be helpful to women as well as men. Ignorance of this has cost thousands of people their privilege of happiness, 
even though they possessed riches. The emotions of love and sex leave their unmistakable marks upon the features. Moreover, these signs are so visible that all who wish may read them. The man who is driven by the storm of passion, based upon sex desires alone, plainly advertises that fact to the entire world by the expression of his eyes and the lines of his face. The emotion of love, when mixed with the emotion of sex, softens, modifies, and beautifies the facial expression. No character analyst is needed to tell you this. You may observe it for yourself. The emotion of love brings out and develops the artistic and aesthetic nature of man. It leaves its impress upon one's very soul, even after the fire has been subdued by time and circumstance. Memories of love never pass. They linger, guide, and influence long after the source of stimulation has faded. There is nothing new in this. Every person who has been moved by genuine love knows that it leaves enduring traces upon the human heart. The effect of love endures because love is spiritual in nature. The man who cannot be stimulated to great heights of achievement by love is hopeless. He is dead, though he may seem to live. Even the memories of love are sufficient to lift one to a higher plane of creative effort. The major force of love may spend itself and pass away, like a fire which has burned itself out, but it leaves behind indelible marks as evidence that it has passed that way. Its departure often prepares the human heart for a still greater love. Go back into your yesteryears at times and bathe your mind in the beautiful memories of past love. It will soften the influence of the present worries and annoyances. It will give you a source of escape from the unpleasant realities of life, and maybe, who knows, your mind will yield to you, during this temporary retreat into the world of fantasy, ideas or plans which may change the entire financial or spiritual status of your life. If you believe yourself unfortunate because you have loved and lost, perish the thought. One who has loved truly can never lose entirely. Love is whimsical and temperamental. Its nature is ephemeral and transitory. It comes when it pleases and goes away without warning. Accept and enjoy it while it remains, but spend no time worrying about its departure. Worry will never bring it back. Dismiss also the thought that love never comes but once. Love may come and go, times without number, but there are no two love experiences which affect one in just the same way. There may be, and there usually is, one love experience which leaves a deeper imprint on the heart than all the others. But all love experiences are beneficial except to the person who becomes resentful and cynical when love makes its departure. There should be no disappointment over love, and there would be none if people understood the difference between the emotions of love and sex. The major difference is that love is spiritual, while sex is biological. No experience which touches the human heart with a spiritual force can possibly be harmful, except through ignorance or jealousy. Love is, without question, life's greatest experience. It brings one into communication with infinite intelligence. When mixed with the emotions of romance and sex, it may lead one far up the ladder of creative effort. The emotions of love, sex, and romance are sides of the eternal triangle of achievement, building genius. Nature creates genii through no other force. Love is an emotion with many sides, shades, and colors. The love which one feels for parents or children is quite different from that which one feels for one's sweetheart. The one is mixed with the emotion of sex, while the other is not. The love which one feels in true friendship is not the same as that felt for one's sweetheart, parents, or children, but it too is a form of love. Then there is the emotion of love for things inanimate, such as the love of nature's handiwork. But the most intense and burning of all these various kinds of love is that experienced in the blending of the emotions of love and sex. Marriages, not blessed with the eternal affinity of love, properly balanced and proportioned with sex, cannot be happy ones, and seldom endure. Love alone will not bring happiness in marriage, nor will sex alone. When these two beautiful emotions are blended, marriage may bring about a state of mind closest to the spiritual that one may ever know on this earthly plane. When the emotion of romance is added to those of love and sex, 
the obstructions between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence are removed. Then a genius has been born. What a different story is this than those usually associated with the emotion of sex. Here is an interpretation of the emotion which lifts it out of the commonplace and makes of it potter's clay in the hands of God, from which he fashions all that is beautiful and inspiring. It is an interpretation which would, when properly understood, bring harmony out of the chaos which exists in too many marriages. The disharmonies often expressed in the form of nagging may usually be traced to lack of knowledge on the subject of sex. Where love, romance, and the proper understanding of the emotion and function of sex abide, there is no disharmony between married people. Fortunate is the husband whose wife understands the true relationship between the emotions of love, sex, and romance. When motivated by this holy triumvirate, no form of labor is burdensome, because even the most lowly form of effort takes on the nature of a labor of love. It is a very old saying that a man's wife may either make him or break him, but the reason is not always understood. The making and breaking is the result of the wife's understanding or lack of understanding of the emotions of love, sex, and romance. Despite the fact that men are polygamous by the very nature of their biological inheritance, it is true that no woman has as great an influence on a man as his wife unless he is married to a woman totally unsuited to his nature. If a woman permits her husband to lose interest in her and become more interested in other women, it is usually because of her ignorance or indifference toward the subjects of sex, love, and romance. This statement presupposes, of course, that genuine love once existed between a man and his wife. The facts are equally applicable to a man who permits his wife's interest in him to die. Married people often bicker over a multitude of trivialities. If these are analyzed accurately, the real cause of the trouble will often be found to be indifference or ignorance on these subjects. Man's greatest motivating force is his desire to please woman. The hunter who excelled during prehistoric days before the dawn of civilization did so because of his desire to appear great in the eyes of woman. Man's nature has not changed in this respect. The hunter of today brings home no skins of wild animals, but he indicates his desire for her favor by supplying fine clothes, motor cars, and wealth. Man has the same desire to please woman that he had before the dawn of civilization. The only thing that has changed is his method of pleasing. Men who accumulate large fortunes and attain to great heights of power and fame do so mainly to satisfy their desire to please women. Take women out of their lives and great wealth would be useless to most men. It is this inherent desire of man to please woman which gives woman the power to make or break a man. The woman who understands man's nature and tactfully caters to it need have no fear of competition from other women. Men may be giants with indomitable willpower when dealing with other men, but they are easily managed by the woman of their choice. Most men will not admit that they are easily influenced by the women they prefer because it is in the nature of the male to want to be recognized as the stronger of the species. Moreover, the intelligent woman recognizes this manly trait and very wisely makes no issue of it. Some men know that they are being influenced by the women of their choice, their wives, sweethearts, mothers, or sisters, but they tactfully refrain from rebelling against the influence because they are intelligent enough to know that no man is happy or complete without the modifying influence of the right woman. The man who does not recognize this important truth deprives himself of the power which has done more to help men achieve success than all other forces combined.